Oh, hi. You caught me enjoying myself in Canada. Speaking of incredible lands, let's talk about Greg Land. Hello! Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. You know, I try not to go too negative on this channel, but today I'm going to talk about an artist who I personally do not care for. That being said, I think I understand some of why he's popular. He certainly is popular enough to get regular work on a top-tier title like Uncanny X-Men, but I don't care for the work. However, that said, I'm going to explain why I don't like certain aspects of the work, and I think that even if you disagree with me, we can learn something by having a conversation on what I consider the de-evolution of an artist and the flaws and problems with his storytelling skills specifically. Today I want to talk about Greg Land. Greg Land's first published comic book was for the small press publisher Caliber Press on their 1994 book Storm Quest. And I'm not going to knock Land for producing artwork that aims at the same stylistic techniques as Jim Lee. Artists are often influenced by what's popular at the time. But if we look at a cover by Jim Lee on Stormwatch from just one year earlier, and now we line it up, we can see that at least one character that Greg Land illustrated was copied from another artist's work. In the industry, this is called swiping, and it's basically the worst thing that you can do, at least in the eyes of your fellow contemporaries and colleagues. It's stealing their work. It's taking somebody else's hard work to create an illustration and tracing it. And unfortunately, Greg Land was doing that from day one. But the expectations of what a fellow colleague or professional might expect out of you as an artist is different than what fans and publishers want. And the fact is, Greg Land could do things that pleased both of them, including hitting deadlines. In 1995, Land illustrated a story for DC Comics in New Titans Annual No. 11, and in 1996, he followed that by illustrating a Juggernaut story in X-Men Unlimited Issue 13. While I wouldn't say the artwork is mind-blowing, it still presented a clear, coherent story about the X-Men villain Juggernaut trying and failing to wander a small town as himself on Halloween evening. We'll come back to this later to compare to his more current work. From 1997 through 2001, Greg Land worked consistently at DC Comics with some fill-in stories and a long run on both Birds of Prey and Nightwing. While the artwork is a bit more recognizable as what Greg produces now, it's still pretty fluid with solid composition and consistent character work. Emotions are clear and readable, and the angles on the action are varied and interesting. Eagle-eyed fans did spot the occasional swipe, like this instance that copies a Scott McDaniel Nightwing, or this instance of tracing Brian Boland's Joker from The Killing Joke. That isn't good, but it might be forgivable if it ended there. After all, Greg Land was still pretty fresh and new to comics, and maybe as he gained more confidence in his artwork and left behind that propensity to swipe others' artwork, maybe it could have been forgiven as just somebody learning the ropes. Unfortunately, he turned into the Hamburglar of comics. In 2001, Greg Land went to work for CrossGen Comics. CrossGen was an experiment at doing things a bit differently. They began publishing ongoing comics in 2000 in a shared universe, but instead of writers and artists working freelance, like they usually did at Marvel or DC, the talent were all salaried employees who worked a normal work shift at CrossGen Studios in Tampa, Florida. The head creative team overseeing things was comprised of professional writers Barbara Kessel, Ron Mars, and Mark Wade. Greg Land was the artist assigned to the new fantasy title Sojourn, and he stuck with it all the way through CrossGen's bankruptcy in 2003 and eventual purchase by Disney in 2004. And at this point, his style changes drastically. Now, his rendering becomes much more focused on a photorealistic style, and a lot of his panels start looking a bit stiff. And that's because at some point, Land started relying very heavily on photo reference to illustrate his pages. 
And in case you're thinking, maybe he just changed inkers or something like that, no. Drew Garrisey inked his work at DC and stuck with land at CrossGen. I don't have examples of every instance of land using existing magazines or movie screenshots, but here are a few to show you what I'm talking about. Sources that Land started to use regularly included images from pro wrestling, Pamela Anderson, Sports Illustrated, and, by his own admission, porn. And it's at this point that Greg Land really started to make a name for himself and get recognized. He's mostly known for his ability to draw beautiful women. And you know what? Using reference isn't necessarily the issue here. It's using reference that you yourself did not create. For instance, uh, if you take a photo of some models and then you light box or use digital techniques to recreate that as comic book art, I don't think anybody's going to have a problem with those techniques. There's plenty of artists that do stuff like that. It's the fact that Greg Land will use images that he doesn't have the rights to, that he didn't create. Uh, for instance, in the back of an issue of Sojourn, there's some of his sketchbook work showing how he came about creating characters. For instance, the villain in the book Sojourn uh, is named Mordath. And if you take a look at his drawing and then you Google Boris Karloff the Mummy, you instantly get pretty much the same image. I don't know how it hasn't become a legal issue for the publishers yet. Back in 1991, a cover for Doctor Strange used photo reference that earned Marvel a lawsuit. Jackson Geis used an image of singer Amy Grant as reference for Doctor Strange's girlfriend at the time. Grant's management sued Marvel, not because they owned the copyright to the image that lay with the photographer, but because they feared her fans could see this and construe it as her supporting the comic. At the time, Grant was popular with Christians, so being associated with a book like Doctor Strange could be a potential problem. The issue was settled out of court with Marvel not admitting to wrongdoing, but you have to imagine it cost them a lot, and that they wouldn't want to risk something like this again. But I guess they're willing to roll the dice, because once Greg Land left CrossGen, they hired him. Sometimes it's relatively subtle to see his reference, like when he uses Sandra Bullock. Other times, it's pretty obvious that Ray Liotta and Ben Affleck are dropping by to say hello. Land worked for about a year on Ultimate Fantastic Four for Marvel, and at this point, I feel that his use of reference became a reliance on reference, to his detriment as an artist. Does his version of Invisible Woman look beautiful? Sure, but it's inconsistent. In one panel, she'll have straight hair, and in the next, it turns wavy. Because he's so locked into using reference, Land forgets to be consistent. He also seems to be losing his ability to be creative. His version of Mr. Fantastic seems to have created an amazing interdimensional machine in one issue of Fantastic Four, but it's clearly just a clutch plate to anyone who's ever worked on a car. Another issue with Land's use of reference of beautiful women means that everyone becomes sexy even when it isn't necessarily appropriate. The Ultimate Universe version of Invisible Woman is supposed to be about 20, but he draws her older. He has more extreme instances later in his career, like teenage Kitty Pride or teenage Hope Summers being drawn as though they're women when other artists portrayed them younger. It speaks to how all the women in Greg Land's pages start to look very, very similar. Beyond just looking similar, one problem with Greg Land's women is that they frequently look like they're in the middle of ecstasy. Uh, because of the sources he uses, frequently using porn, these women look like they're ecstatic, when instead, if you read the story, they're supposed to be portrayed as uh, driven, or angry, or wounded, but instead we get faces like these, where this is Sue Storm supposedly scared, and later in that same issue, this is Sue Storm totally surprised. But to me, neither of those read as scared or surprised. They look like something else. Right after Ultimate Fantastic Four, Greg Land illustrated all nine issues of the series Ultimate Power, which involved superheroes from two universes battling. This ran from 2006 to 2008, and it shows yet another issue with Greg Land's technique of using reference. 
he'll reuse his own drawings. And nowhere is this more on display than in this series, where his version of Fantastic Four member The Thing is constantly recycled with the same face. He's drawn the same over and over and over and over. And look, there's nothing morally wrong with reusing and recycling your own illustrations. If Greg Land wants to save time by reusing a pose, more power to him. Except it does create a very repetitive reading experience. You start to notice these things. Things just look the same, they look stiff, they lose some energy. But I guess it worked, because from here, Greg Land started working on Uncanny X-Men. This included his debut on the title in Uncanny X-Men issue 500. It included a large gatefold cover, and thanks to the work of a lady who uses the online handle Selena, we can see that Land reused a lot of previous work to control c control v his way to a finished cover. One small part was copied, but not from his own work, but from artist John Cassidy. And unfortunately, Greg Land has done this pretty regularly. He especially likes copying the work of other photorealistic artists, like Brian Hitch and Travis Charest. And by the way, both of those artists started out with much looser work that evolved into something beautiful. It's disappointing to see Land plagiarize, but even more disappointing is what copying and tracing reference has done to his panel-to-panel -panel storytelling. I'm going to use Uncanny X-Men issue 541 as an example. It's a story involving the X-Men battling Juggernaut, and it has all of Greg Land's tropes on display. Every woman is drawn as a sex pot, including 15-year-old Hope Summers and the mayor of San Francisco, here seen grabbing at her skirt like she's Marilyn Monroe standing on an exhaust grate. Photorealistic faces that change from one panel to the next, like this one of Cyclops going from thin lips to big pouty ones. Obvious sources of photo reference. And look at what it's done to his panel layout. Almost all of Land's pages will now use what you might call a widescreen panel layout. Lots of panels that stretch either horizontally or vertically across the page as though they're stills from a movie. But in comics, that's not always the best layout. On this page, it ends up giving us panels that are full of unused negative space or are pulled in so tight on the subject that you can barely tell what's going on. Let's jump back to one of Greg Land's first stories that we looked at earlier, the Juggernaut story in X-Men Unlimited. What a contrast. Maybe the individual panels in his newer work look more visually attractive, depending on what you like. But panel to panel, it's a mess. It's not easy to follow his current work, and the expressions are not always clear and accurate. It's all kind of unfortunate because I think that Greg Land initially had some pretty good instincts on how to lay out a page, but his over-reliance on using reference has led to stiff figure work, confusing expressions, and a number of other issues that I've already discussed. I don't need to repeat all of that. But the fact is, when you stop using your own imagination, and instead your greatest tool as an artist becomes your ability to use Google Image Search with the safe search filter off, you lose a lot of energy. You lose that dynamic ability to, to sort of guide your readers through a scene panel to panel. That's just as important as drawing an individual panel or person to look cool. So I just think that Greg Land has slowly de-evolved as an artist. Uh, it, it's depressing. It's also depressing because he's quite popular and a lot of younger readers will probably see this and think of it as, well, I can just pull up some images on Google and trace them with a light box or open it in Photoshop and have another layer and just trace that. And I think you lose a lot. I think that your work is no longer readable. I think that you can create an individual good image, but you lose the ability to tell a story. Look, it starts looking more and more like movies. But comic books are not movies. They're better, in my opinion. And if you take away the ability to, to be energetic and to do anything with your storytelling, to move the camera anywhere, and to give people dynamic expressions and interesting interactions, I don't know. I think that you lose everything special about comics, and you only get sort of a, a knockoff version 
of still images from movies, which is nowhere nearly as interesting to me. Just my two cents. All right, we have some fan art this week. I've got two pieces. The first one here is from Matteo Gullen, who says that this is me as Doomsday, Superman's arch enemy. Matteo, this is fantastic. I love it. Thank you very, very much. Next up is Lloyd Edward Heidler, who is also one of my supporters on Patreon, and he illustrates me being beaten up by Rob Liefeld while simultaneously using as many of the tropes I listed in my episodes about Rob Liefeld as possible. Strange body proportions, lots of pouches, feet covered by rocks. Lloyd, this is hilarious. I love it. All right, now I'm going to give one of them a gachapon that I picked up in Japan. Since there's only two people, I'm going to flip a coin, see who wins. Uh, so we'll say that heads is Mateo and tails is Lloyd Edward. And that's tails, Lloyd Edward. I'm going to have to send that to you. I believe you said you're in Germany. That's going to be expensive, so be it. Let's see what you get reach into the bag of gachapon. There's still a lot left. Uh, this is, I think, Ultraman. Doesn't that look like Ultraman to you guys? I think so. So I don't know exactly what it is, but very Japanese-y, so that's pretty cool. It's something you build. I hope you enjoy it. This was a challenging episode, folks. Uh, I have less time than ever with my new job. It's very difficult, but I am committed to delivering at least one episode of Comic Tropes every week. I'm trying to give you what you want. Uh, a look at artist techniques, a look at comic book history, stuff that hopefully you haven't seen repeated um, in, you know, a million other YouTube videos. Uh, I'm trying. Uh, you know, it was it was a challenge to do this one and talk about Greg Land, someone that I just personally do not care for the artwork. And yet, he's got tons of comic book work to look at. It's so much that it's almost intimidating to figure out, like, which issues should I have used to back up my arguments. Uh, because there's just so much out there. So it was a lot of work. I, I hope it works for you. I hope, you know, even if you disagree with me, you at least understand the points I'm trying to make. I hope so. Um, it's, it's tough times for me lately, folks. Uh, I'm very busy with work, but I'm very stressed out. Um, money is tight, and, you know, my mental health, it's, it's just not where I want it to be. Um, yeah, just, just really tough time. But I do want to say that one thing that does help me is actually having this show to work on, having a schedule, and having, for the most part, some pretty good feedback, you know? Um, I don't really read too much of the YouTube comments anymore. It, the channel has grown to a level that I'm very happy about, but, you know, there, there's some negative stuff in there, and I, I just can't read it all anymore. But in social media and on Patreon, you know, there's some really interesting, good, helpful feedback. Because I don't expect that I'm doing everything just right, but I really do appreciate when somebody has an insightful criticism that can help try to create a better show. I promise I'm trying. I'm always trying to improve the show. I don't know how the audio is in this episode compared to previous ones. I have put a ton of soundproofing all around. I'm trying to reduce the echo. Uh, I'm looking into better lights once I can afford it. So, just want you to know that I'm always working on the show, trying to produce something good. Um, I'm excited about the artist that we're going to talk about next week. Uh, no hints, no hints, but it's, it, it's somebody that I think is fantastic. I think you're going to like it, too. Uh, there's some really, really fun stuff coming up soon, too. So, please stick with us. Thank you so much for watching, subscribing, sharing. I appreciate all of that. And you know what? Until I come back, why don't you keep reading comics?